Thank you so much, and thanks for the warm introduction. And I'm so happy to be here in sunny, well, not so sunny Brighton today. Um, it's been amazing so far, so let's get into it. So I hope you can see this picture of me. It was taken in 2018, and it was just when I had graduated from Code First Girls in their web development course. And I basically just built a HTML and CSS website in a group of three. And I was like, I'm a web developer. This is amazing. Like, I'm just going to go and apply for internships now. And as you can tell, or you may have guessed from that naivety, I do not come from a computer science background. I was actually studying um, economics and accounting at the time. And with economics and going to finance roles, they didn't say, hey, have a portfolio of a list of all the accounts you've balanced. Um, so it was, quite <laughs> it was quite like, oh my gosh, this... Uh, Computer science thing is actually quite hard to break into, and I underestimated just how challenging it would be. So I was like, okay, I've done my web develop development, I'm applying for internships, they're not getting back to me, can't think why, so let me do another course. So I did their web application course, so I learned Python, and I thought, we're really getting serious now. I was doing APIs, and I was like, this is, maybe this isn't for me anymore. But I was like, do you know what, we'll see. I went back to university to finish my final um, year, and then, of course, the pandemic hit next year. And so I figured now this is a great time to take the coding thing really seriously because I have all this time in the world to do it. There's no more sacrificing of, oh, should I go out with friends or should I just be locked up because Boris won't let us out? So that was a very, very easy decision to make. So I decided to upskill during that time. I was stalking computer science graduates because I was like, okay, what do they have over me? Minus, you know, obviously a whole three to four year degree. And I figured, I'm going to teach other women how to code through Code First Girls. That's, this will be fun. And actually, I was battling imposter syndrome during that time. And it was funny because I kept saying, where is the line between actually being an imposter and having imposter syndrome? Because the reality was, I did not have a computer science degree. I wasn't necessarily even equipped to... Um, instruct other women to learn how to code because I was basically learning how to code and like regurgitating my learnings during the time. Um, so I was like, am I an imposter? Is it imposter syndrome? Who really knows at this point? And so I just do everything humanly possible to learn how to code, to go reach out into mentorship and also to lean into the various different communities which are pivotal in me eventually being able to land a software engineering role. And so in September 2020, that's when I won my first award, the Pay It Forward Award with Code First Girls. I was like, oh my gosh, I've won an award. Like, I don't even have a software engineering role, but like, I've won this award for going back to teach Code First Girls when I was originally a student. And I was like, oh, this is, this is really odd. Um, and it was weird because some of the questions that they were asking me when I was teaching other women during this time was, how do I land a role? And I'm thinking, I'm not even in a role. <laughs> um, how am I meant to tell you? Maybe we should just do the same steps together. Um, and then I landed a data analyst role, but eventually I decided I really didn't want to do data analysis. Like, I felt like it was a cute transition, especially coming from an economics background, but I really wanted to be building new product, like new, um, yeah, new products, new features. I just wanted to be a software engineer. So I joined the Sky Get Into Tech Scheme, which was amazing because I had a huge community of other women come from non-technical backgrounds and we all learn how to go together. And in February 2021, it's when I got my first offer. I was like, oh my gosh, I've got my first offer as a junior software engineer. It starts in September. And then I was like now semi-relaxed during the course because I knew I had my job offer, but I was also extremely panicked. During the pandemic, that's when I saw so many people posting online about how they had job offers, but now it's going to be gone because of obviously the hiring freeze, they couldn't let people in. Um, so I was like, oh, well, they've, I can see from this email that I've looked at 13 times just today, this morning, that I actually, they have accepted me, but I was just so scared that um, they'd say, sorry, we got the wrong amber. I remember even during the, um, assessment center, I was looking, is there any other Ambers in case they get me confused? Maybe like I got lucky with the um, interviewer and maybe this felt a bit sorry for me because they saw I was trying so hard and they thought, you know, well, let's, let's just let her in. Um, we kind of feel a bit bad for her. And I started to think, oh, maybe if I got another interviewer, I may not have landed this role. And maybe they like saw something that like, I kind of like fooled them into offering me a space. But the reality was, and this was imposter syndrome. Um, and imposter syndrome, 
essentially left me feeling like this whole heap of anxiety and it's something that it's great that we can have these open conversations that it just is not a nice feeling um, but it's defined as when individuals feel like they've ended up in esteemed roles or positions not because of their competencies but because of some oversight or luck and on top of that from doing more research into it I was actually failing to internalize my own successes. So I was so focused on all the things I didn't have. And in the context of going through job interviews with no coding background, the constant feedback I got was, you know, we like you. You seem like a good person. You seem really infused, but you're just not technical enough. And the one that really burnt was when I was applying for an 18 month intern internship, apprenticeship. And I was like, this is literally for people who don't have technical backgrounds. It's a very, very, it's like the starting point. And the feedback I got was, wow, you seem so organized. And I'm talking about, yeah, like I'm teaching other women how to code and I just won this award and I've built this project. And they said, you'd be a really good project um, manager. And that was just such a stab in the heart. It just made me feel like, am I deluded? As, are people not like all the effort that I'm making, is that just not good enough? And that's just what fueled my insecurities going into the industry. But I'm not alone in this. And the reality is 70% of people have experienced imposter syndrome at some point in their lives. Can you put your hands up if you ever experienced imposter syndrome? <laughs> okay, nice. Well, not nice, but you get what I mean. <laughs> So from doing some intense research into imposter syndrome, because I noticed that, you know, the women that I, um, the network that I built from being part of the Skygate into Tech scheme, it seemed like when we all started our jobs, we all had very similar problems. One, managers didn't necessarily know how to deal with people who don't come from technical backgrounds. And secondly, we didn't know where the benchmark was. So especially in the case of a finance where it's like you kind of, are expected to know things. I can't imagine me um, doing some accounts and saying, do you know what, we're just like a few hundred pounds off. Like it's kind of, it's very, very um, accurate. <laughs> you have to be pretty accurate. And so it was kind of an adjustment to realize that, oh, devs break things all the time. Like this is just something that we accept. Like we just, you know, push things. And then in a few days there may just be an incident and everything seems to come crashing down. Um, but that's something that we just did not know how to deal with. And that's what um, fueled this desire to learn more about imposter syndrome. So I was looking into where it came from, and it was in 1978 where Dr. Pauline Clance was doing research into high achieving women and why they had this sense of fraudulence. Um, they realized that it wasn't a case of people having lack of qualifications. It was normally the people that were very high achieving. And but obviously we know that this is not just a women's problem and that everyone experiences some degree of imposter syndrome at some point in their lives. So we're going to talk about six ways that it can show up. So the imposter cycle. And when I saw this, this made me think back to when I was a, uni, a university student. So the imposter cycle starts off with an achievement related task. So maybe that's a PR. For me, I was thinking about my exams. And that, that achievement and related task can feel a sense of self-doubt and worry. And there's, two, and there's two ways people react when they're, doing, when they're part of this cycle. The one way is to procrastinate. Can I get hands up for the procrastinators? You're my people. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And the other side is to over-prepare. So, and then when, you know, the PR's merged or you pass the exam, the people that procrastinate think, well, I actually got lucky because I wasn't really doing much. And then like the last two weeks, I'm just like going hard, going in. And I just happened to get all the right answers in the end. And the people that over prepare say, well, I had to work really hard for this. I'm sorry. I, I'm so, who are the people that over prepare? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lovely to see the small community. <laughs> um, and they, and they um, credit it to, well, I've had to work really hard for this. And then... It actually doesn't help, even though the evidence is, no matter how you responded, you still got the results that you desired. It still has that sense of panic in the end, and the cycle just continues. And also the need to be the very best. I don't know how many of you were like, maybe been super smart in college or sixth form, and then you go to university, and it's just like, damn, I'm, I'm no longer number one. <laughs> And that can fuel the sense of imposter syndrome because people who feel this way feel like um, they need to be the smartest person or at least like the top 1% to feel a sense of worthiness or accomplishment and that they're not an imposter. 
and of course the fear of failure. I feel like so many people experience this, but in, in terms of imposter syndrome, it's a case of, well, if I fail and if I don't know, then everyone's going to know that I'm an imposter, so I can't afford to fail or else everyone else is going to find out. And discounting praise. How many times have you found someone who's experiencing imposter syndrome, like, huh? You are literally doing X, Y, and Z. Like, how can someone like you have imposter syndrome? You can see the fact that they're like visibly uncomfortable and they normally can't actually accept the praise that you're giving them because they're actually just focused on all the things that they don't have rather than the words of encouragement that you're giving them in the moment. And fear surrounding success. This was a really interesting one for me to do more research on because it was actually the case of, so for like, let's give the example of me getting to my first dev role. So imagine I've worked so hard to even get my first role, but the reality was I did have this underlying fear of success that if I do get the role, what if when I'm in it, I'm just not good enough? And everyone's gonna know that, oh, now that you're in, you need to get, you need to get out. Um, so that's something that's, that um, is very prevalent as well. But we're here to talk about overworking. And this is the Superman, Superwoman aspects. And this is about, like, it's essentially, think about the hardest worker in your team. They're normally doing so much. Sometimes they're, like, the first in the office, last to leave. You, some, you look at them and you think, wow, like, you're, you're, doing, you're doing a lot and you, you're not actually sure how they're able to keep it up. This is normally the Superman, Superwoman person. And this is just a meme that I think perfectly describes them. So going back to, to my journey and in terms of, is this time we're going down? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm getting caught. Cool. Anyway, um, so my profile, economics and accounting graduate, software engineer, high achiever and perfectionist. And perfectionism definitely fuels this overworking type. But before I go to perfectionism, I do want to make it clear. There's a difference between a healthy pursuit for excellence versus an unhealthy pursuit for perfection. Perfection is basically when you actually, um, you don't want any flaws, there's no bad feedback, like, because you're just actually perfect. And so it's not in the absence of excellence, it's just not a healthy thing. But, and I used to be that person like, oh, what's your weakness? I'm like a perfectionist, um, it's really hard. Um, so I used to like use that as like my weakness in interviews, which is so cringe, but <laughs> it was just a thing. Like even, even advice I'd get at university, like when people say, you're weak, um, what's your weakness? You need to rephrase it you need to make it out like as a positive thing so that was my positive thing and one I don't really think that's a question people ask anymore thank goodness but let's just leave that out of um, when we talk about our weaknesses for sure but the reality is Brene Brown says it perfectly the underlying thought process it but behind a perfectionist is if I do everything perfectly and live perfectly, I can avoid feelings of blame, judgment, and shame. And when she said this, I was literally quivering in my boots because I didn't know that these were the subconscious thoughts um, that was underlying my perfectionism because I really thought that perfectionism is such a good thing. But the reality is it was holding me back from actually taking vital steps in my life. I had high functioning anxiety and I relied a lot on external validation to make me feel worthy enough. So yeah, high functioning anxiety, especially when it comes to overworking, the lack of breaks, because you feel like, oh, if I take a break, then I may not be able to um, finish this task. Um, I may, you just have these feelings of like, I may not be able to do it and I don't deserve it. But the reality is, and what I really like about the tech community is that we always say stuff like, well, actually there's two, let me not say too many good things about tech community because there's, <laughs> there's one side of the tech community is like, take breaks. I get my best ideas when I'm in the shower or I get my best ideas when I go on a walk. But then there's the other side of the tech community is like, I work every second of the day. If you're not coding on the weekends, what are you really doing? I've just built 10 projects in six hours. <laughs> and sometimes that's really hard because if you're the overworking type and you need that external validation and you feel like you need to work super hard, seeing those things on the internet from the community is just not helpful. Um, so I had to check myself there. And people with, who tend to overwork often get burnt out. Um, can you put your hands up if you've been burnt out at some point? Oh yeah. Put your hands up if you're still suffering from burnout. 
<laughs> my burnout recovery people, let's all group together at the end and just give each other a hug because I need some help and some tips. So if any of you know how to deal with burnout, please let me know. And then, of course, the tendency to forget accomplishments. So sometimes it's a case of, okay, I've just done this PR, it's been merged now, and then the new, the new assignment comes, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I want to get through this one. And you're forgetting all the times when you've proven to yourself that you are actually able to learn and grow, especially with the support of your team as well, which is why we're talking about working environments as well. But, oh, unless you're colorblind, I am a black woman. And so, in the case of navigating this world, when I was growing up, I was taught to work twice as hard as my white counterparts to get half of what they get. And so this fueled like my desire, I guess, to overwork and I feel like I constantly had to prove myself. And in the case of being a woman in tech, sometimes being on social media and like women in tech without like the social media sometimes is like quite fun. And the comments like, you're not a real developer and you're just a diversity hire. And this is something that didn't necessarily necessarily say it to me but the fact that I'm seeing these comments about other female developers I think that oh great maybe my colleagues will think that I'm just a diversity hire so now I need to go above and beyond even more just to prove that I actually do belong here and so as much as I do love talking about imposter syndrome I do have to give it this kind of context this is a really really great article and um, it's just the fact that Imposter syndrome puts the blame on the individual and it doesn't actually account for the way that we are in society and also the fact that work environments can place a huge, huge um, impact on how we feel about ourselves, especially in the context of internalising our successes. So definitely check out this article. So I'm not here to represent my company, but I just happen to have had an incredible experience and my team have been really good in terms of having inclusive practices that make me feel like I truly belong. So one thing is having a feedback culture. And this is not just a slide to say, I'm amazing, um, but it was just a really good example of feedback that I received recently. So it starts off with the hype. Amber's done an incredible job. That's just what I needed. Then he goes on to actually list all the things that I did in ways that I would not have described it, like set that, having my dev set up, um, actively asking questions, doing pairing, driver's seat for implementing database-related tasks, tombstoning. And in the context of being a front-end engineer for like two years and going to back-end development, um, I was like, database, tombstoning, oh my gosh, like I really did that. Um, and it was so good for this person to actually list out all these things, because as far as I, I was concerned, I was struggling to get set up in my dev environment. There were so many bugs. I was, they were basically telling me all the commands. I had to delete a table, and even in this, um, it's just so funny because um, at the bottom it says, contributed to multiple incidents. The incidents that they're talking about is actually the, the second, was the um, implementing the database related task, the tombstoning. I deleted one column, <laughs> and then all of a sudden everything is on fire. So I just thought that was just so funny that, <laughs> that it's like, well done on deleting this thing. Also, thanks for being around when it just broke everything. So I thought that was just so good. Um, but it was, it was actually a great example of, oops, of having a psychologically safe environment. That he basically communicated that, look, mate, like you're new to this back-end development thing, but we're all around to support you as well. And obviously, um, he helped me to track the wins, but I always encourage people to track their wins. I created a free template. It's zero pounds and zero pence. Um, you can just use the QR code there, but it's just a Notion, um, Notion page you can duplicate just to track your wins. It has little things like going on a walk in a park or like saved a hundred pounds or you presented in a meeting. It's like the small wins really do matter. So when, even when, you know, I went through a, a awful interview and there's an interview that you know sometimes people say in a year's time you know you're not going to think about it there's an interview that was two years ago that I still sometimes scream about because it was so easy like it was actually so easy but at the time because I didn't have any experience with it in it it was so hard but in that moment all I needed to do was just open up a template that shared like all the stuff I had been doing so I had some kind of hope and um before Will Smith was unfortunately known for a slap, he actually had some, <laughs> I know, he had some really, really good motivational videos. And one of them that I am literally obsessed with is fail early, fail often, and fail forward. 
The thing about going into like the tech industry is the fact that we're learning all the time and we're breaking things all the time. And actually the error messages that we see are ways that we can guide ourselves to actually find the solution. So this has been great in terms of developing a growth mindset. And even when I was learning how to code, I remember like stuff would be broken. I'd be like, okay, it's just, it's just broken and kind of like push it to the side. But my instructor was like, hey, like let's just keep going into this and let's try to find a solution. She taught me a lot about grit and it helped me to realize that just because things aren't working straight away, some things just take extra time. And that's just so helpful to be around people who have a strong, strong learning mindset. But again, this can really be fostered when you have that psychologically safe environment. A message that my colleague sent to me, and I was just like, again, I'm not here to represent my employer. I was actually going to um, cross out the employer because I felt like they're really not paying me to be here kind of vibes. But, um, <laughs> but I'll read it out to you. It said, when I started at Skyscanner, one of the things that helped me the most was having someone I could just ask anything I didn't know. The whole squad was great, but my onboarding buddy made all the difference. With his help, I completed my first project at Skyscanner, and that really helped me settle in and do stuff here. I just want to pay that forward and set you up for success. I was just like, that's just so nice. <laughs> it was just such a nice reassuring message that you really have my back, and to communicate that is, is so, so, it just makes such a big difference. Because sometimes we kind of assume like, well, of course I'm here. You know, like it's kind of obvious, but to make that explicitly clear, and because one thing about me, I can chase people. I can reach out, ask for help, but it's another thing when they come to me and they say like, hey, I'm going to reach out to you, I'm going to check in on you. It makes such a big difference and it takes all the pressure off of me as well. And of course, to take intentional breaks. As an overworker, sometimes we feel like we can't do that. But the fortunate thing is, like even with me, sometimes I just wake up and in the work at home vibe, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm just going to lie in for a bit. It's 8.50, kind of get out of bed, open my laptop. I'm just like, haven't moved, I'm just working. And I think, oh, I feel bad because I may feel a bit behind or I feel like, oh, if I, if I get up now, there's no going back kind of vibes. But to take intentional breaks is so powerful. And I've been really fortunate enough to have a manager who just says, yo, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. Um, maybe you should just take, it's always good to take time off, like if you're feeling what, unwell because whenever I felt unwell I was like I can't take a break I can still work and power through this but having a manager that says hey you know sick days are there for a reason it's actually your right to take it makes the big difference because of course we can assume that people know that but for that to be reiterated is so powerful and there's some cool ways that you can implement this. So one thing I had in my previous workplace was walking meetings. That was just so cool. So either we walked with each other um, when we were having our one-to-ones or we'd be on a phone call while we were walking. Um, it, just, it just helped to, just like, to get out of the house, to have a break, but also be doing something productive at the same time. Also meeting breaks as well. So in, the squ well, in our squad, we have um, like 12 to two blocked out every day in terms of focus time, and also team team social time. So we every week we have just what a thing called chill time where we do the online games. I'm a big fan of code names. If you're down to be on your laptops later and play with me, I actually just obsessed with the game. And like, you know, Scribble. And if you have any other um, games that you'd recommend, online games, please let me know because I literally am just so obsessed with them. But these are just like a few ways that you can incorporate intentional breaks with the team. Because in the case of the Superman, Superwoman aspects, they can normally relax when they know the whole team is relaxed as well, so they're just not alone in it. And for my overworkers, please find a sustainable rate of working, and this requires experimentation. So I was reading a book, and it was actually called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. It was a bit savage. I didn't end up finishing reading it because it made me feel a bit sad. But one thing that they said was that um, when you work at such a high rate, it now becomes the norm. Um, and so when you work at a rate that other people are working at, sometimes the gap can look as if you're underperforming when the reality is, is that you're just working at the same rate as other people were and you, and you weren't able to sustain the rate in which that you were working. And obviously that leads to burnout and all these other things. So definitely finding a, a sustainable rate of working makes all the difference as well. And how much time how, how long have I been talking for? I've been talking for 10 minutes. This is my last slide. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah, cut that out. <laughs> but to end, <laughs> okay, there's a Squiggly Careers um, podcast and they talk all about, oh wait, is my mic? No, yeah. There's a Squiggly Careers podcast and they say that we're now shifting from at the pressure of being a know-all to now the, um, being a learner-all. And that is so empowering because the reality is we cannot expect to know all of the technology, all the different methods, and with the rate of new things coming out all the time, it's about embracing that learning mindset. And also celebrate your wins and give yourself some compassion. I feel like sometimes we can be so hard on ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for laughing with me, it really helps. <laughs> Sometimes we can be so hard on ourselves, especially when we're high achievers, we know just how much we can do. But it doesn't mean that we should be doing that. Sometimes we're just exhausting ourselves. Look how many people put their hands up when we spoke about burnout. We can't keep normalizing these things. And also know what you bring to the industry. Everyone has a uniqueness that we bring and it doesn't always have to be just a technical thing like yeah I'm really good at CSS I'm really good at testing like sometimes it's the innovative ideas that you come up with sometimes it's the fact that you're super solutions focused and you have a lot of grit or when there's an ILD that you may have caused like myself um, that you're able just to make sure that everyone's calm collected and you're sending out that meet, meet that meeting link and you're leading um, the solution for that so yeah thank you so much <laughs> Thank you.